Time Magazine did a thing today uh, that I saw in the news, how they're struggling with the coronation of King Charles of England. And one of the biggest troubles they're having is finding someone who's willing to perform at his coronation. So far, they've been turned down by Adele, Ed Sheeran, Harry Styles, the Spice Girls. And when you're being turned down by the Spice Girls, that's that's pretty tough, tough deal. Um, But you know, it's it's an interesting thing to watch the the uh, you know monarchy there in England and what have you. And it's one of the few big monarch monarchies left from history. But um, one of the things we need to remember is that Jesus is ultimately the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And uh, one of the things we remember about the Gospel of Matthew is he does, in fact, present Jesus as King. That's one of the perspectives the Gospel of Matthew uh, gives us. And and, uh, it's actually kind of a fun thing to look at the various ways the New Testament Gospels uh, present Jesus. Um, You know, the Gospel of Matthew presents Jesus as um, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, The Gospel of Matthew presents him um, linked to Abraham all the way even through, uh, and and particularly the the line of David. Matthew takes great care to show that. Um, You know, um, in Mark, we see Jesus, um, you know, not as much as um, as presented as a Jew, like in Matthew presents Jesus very Jewish, but... um, but Mark um, speaks specifically not to the Jews, but to the Romans. Uh, Mark's gonna do that while the, the Gospel of Luke speaks to the Greeks, and then John speaks to the New Testament church in kind of a cool way. Um, you know, uh, one of the Gospels, Matthew, speaks of um, groupings of stories of things that happened, whereas Mark is snapshots of things that happened whereas Luke is more a narrative of the whole story, and then John looks at it from more of a mystical kind of order, which is kind of interesting. There's, there's some cool c- comparisons when you study the various gospels and the life of Jesus, <clears throat> but one of the things we're supposed to see is Jesus the Messiah. Remember, the word is Messiah is the word for king, but there's the Messiah, the Christos, Um, That's the way Matthew presents Jesus as the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. One thing that I need to say um, about this, I love going through the Gospel of Matthew with you all because you can't beat studying the life of Jesus. You can't beat that, it's just so good. Um, And also in a day where, um, you know, people ask me, Brett, what do you think about the chosen? And uh, I've got lots of things to say if you really wanna pin me down about it. But as a Bible teacher, one of the things that's hard is whenever they stray from the biblical narrative, you know, poor Debbie, she's just taking in the nuances of Jesus and I'm just going, that's wrong. That's not exactly right. You know, she's like, oh, but Brett, you know, they're like, look at the woman got healed. Yeah, but she didn't do that. And she didn't you know, like, like, and I'm, I'm all particular. Um, you know, Matthew didn't help Jesus write the Sermon on the Mount. If you were watching The Chosen, it, Matthew didn't chip in on that. I'm just saying, even though you watched The Chosen. But I do see, I, there's been times in The Chosen, I have to say, well, that was a neat, you know, attempt at sort of de- depicting a story of the, uh, of the Bible. And so I, I find myself warmed and encouraged by the chosen, some of the, some of the things, but Brett Mormons. Um, well, that's a whole nother argument and, and I, I don't even wanna get into all that, but, but all that to say, um, one of, you wanna know what my biggest concern with the whole chosen thing is, if, if there is the biggest one, um, is that you know, the author, bless his heart, as we say, um, <laughs> The author says, I'm just showing the authentic Jesus. And that's where I I take issue. No, you're not. You're showing your version of who you think Jesus is and you're adding all kinds of interesting little twists and things that are not even in the Bible, not even close. Um, and, and that's great as long as you're really honest about that and say, no, this is my you know, story that I've kind of written into. Kind of, it's not the authentic. You wanna know where you can find the authentic Jesus? Book of Matthew. Right where we are tonight, the, the Bible. Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. So I, just as long as we're all really clear here, if you're watching The Chosen, it doesn't m- mean anything good or bad necessarily. If you're watching it, you're not going to hell. Um, and if you're enjoying it, uh, you might be going to hell. No, I'm just kidding. Just <laughs> totally, No, I'm just totally joking. Um, no, if you're enjoying it, good for you. But let's make sure, let's make really sure that the authentic Jesus is not what we're viewing there. We need, to, we need to realize the authentic Jesus is right here. 
And, uh, and the Bible doesn't need to be improved upon. The Bible doesn't lack for anything. It's everything you'd need to know about Jesus right here. Um, I know some people don't read anymore, so they're like, yeah, but I need to see it on the film, you know? Um, no, uh, it, it's probably time you learn to read. Uh, I just thought I should say that. Uh, anyways, we're, so we're really enjoying going through the authentic Jesus truly right here. And, and uh, what an important thing to do. I don't think we could spend any time doing something more uh, important than looking to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Now we find ourselves getting close to the end of the book here, the end of the story. And um, we're getting more into the serious portion, um, the death of Jesus, um, and uh, you know, it's interesting because we know him to be the lamb that would be led to the slaughter, as Isaiah the prophet would say, and that's, that's where we pick up tonight, as, as he's being sort of led to the slaughter. Um, but also know that he was led willingly. Uh, that's, that's gonna be something we'll see in the story. Um, I love Hebrews 12 too, that talks about how we're to look to Jesus, who's the author and the perfecter of our faith. Um, and it says, um, he, 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 with the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame and was set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So it was something he did willingly. That's something I'd love us to keep in the back of our minds as we're going through this, as we see him, you know, next week we'll be into the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, we're gonna see him being apprehended, uh, but he went willingly and it was you that he had in mind <coughs> and me as well. Um, so Jesus had been telling his disciples what was about to happen for quite some time now. If you recall, even back in Matthew 16, after Peter just uh, you know, said, you're the Christos, the Messiah, uh, then Jesus said, I'm gonna go to Jerusalem and they're gonna kill me and crucify me. <coughs> and so um, now we're getting to that, um, that point. And the disciples have seemingly had a hard time grasping that from the very beginning, that, you know, that what was he coming for? Was he coming to be a political savior uh, for the Romans? the empire or, um, you know, they, I'm not sure they understood. It's almost that they were looking at Jesus and this shouldn't be a shock, but sometimes we New Testament Christians forget this. They were looking at Jesus more in the context of his second coming. Like we're look, we look for Jesus today for his second coming. <clears throat> and we, we have all kinds of scriptures that talk about his second coming. Um, but then if you read the Old Testament, there's like almost seemingly contradictory scriptures. And some people say, see, the Bible's full of contradiction. Well, no, um, the Bible actually did foretell both comings. His first advent, born in Bethlehem, live in this earth, die on the cross for the sins of the world. That was foretold. 300 specific prophecies you can pin down in the Old Testament, exactingly explaining what Jesus would do in his first coming. But then there's all kinds of messianic prophecies about the second coming, where he's gonna come not as a carpenter, but as a conqueror, not to be judged by the world, but be judge over all the world. He's coming in a very different mode in his second coming. And, and so the, the disciples and, and you know um, those religious leaders of the day, they were looking for more of that second coming kind of guy. So a guy riding in on a donkey uh, with a bunch of scrubby disciples from Galilee wasn't really what um, the Jewish people had in mind for this idea of, of um, the, the coming of the Messiah. Um, you know, uh, even Palm Sunday was kind of that, uh, you know, anticlimactic, you know, palm branches, but a colt of a donkey riding into Jerusalem. Is that really gonna, the one who's gonna conquer the Romans as they would ride down the, the streets of Jerusalem with their stallions and their fancy, you know, armor and all their, you know, flags and banners that they would carry uh, through the streets. And, and Jesus comes in with some old clothes on, their, on the back of a donkey with some palm branches. That's all they could get. Um, well, that's because Jesus was coming humble, servant, ready to go to the cross. Um, so in chapter 24, 25, we had the Olivet Discourse. We finished up that last week there on Mount of Olives. That brings us to chapter 26 and 27, which is what, I, what I'll call kind of the road to the cross and the death and burial of Jesus Christ, our Savior. So let's pick it up here in Matthew 26, verse one. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, you know that after two days is the feast of the Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Now this is interesting because um, Jesus is starting to get more specific 
uh, as he has really been fairly specific in the previous parts of Matthew, but he's saying, I'm gonna be crucified on a cross. The word crucified means on a cross, the Romans. By the way, um, did you know that uh, archeological digs back 100 years ago said, well, there's no such things as Roman crucifixion. Like there were actually people that tried to explain there was not such things as Roman crucifixion. Um, but they've found since then, and, and um, even recently, uh, all kinds of evidence of Roman crucifixion. And now it's not even funny. I'm always marveling. I saw another history channel debacle. Uh, uh, I should say, you know, uh, these, these guys that are pipe puffing, cardigan sweater wearing scholars, they're on history channel. Watch out, these people are some serious nincompoops. They do not know what they're talking about. There's no evidence of Jesus Christ. He was living here as a man. Are you kidding me? Like, like it's just so ridiculous. There's no other written about, talked about, evidenced person in the history of the world than Jesus Christ. And yet, isn't it funny how the more, you know, you kind of try to sell it with confidence, people will believe what you're saying. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try not to get into some political things that we've said so emphatically in the last two years that are now being revealed as, oh, uh, we were wrong on that, but nobody's gonna admit they're wrong. Just like they're not gonna admit that Jesus, there's all kinds of evidence. Josephus in the first century wrote about Jesus, uh, a whole bunch of stuff about Jesus and crucifixion and the crosses. Uh, it's all evidence. There's nothing more supported in the history of the world than Jesus Christ. So watch out for all of those people. But, but Jesus now is, is uh, specifically saying, I'm gonna be crucified. And he's mentioning um, here in this chapter uh, is the Passover that's coming up and the betrayal that's about to happen to, to him. Um, all, those, all those truths that we're talking about, the Passover, the betrayal, being crucified are seen in the Old Testament. Um, and the people of that day may have known or should have known, I should say, that Jesus is about ready to fulfill Bible prophecy. But because they weren't looking at Bible prophecy, they missed the whole thing that, you know, remember the Old Testament, all throughout the Old Testament talks about cursed is the one who hangs on a tree. And there's the tree is a picture in the Old Testament oftentimes. Remember the waters of Mara were bitter, but once you threw the tree in, the waters became sweet. Um, and then, you know, that, that's more of an indirect picture of Jesus. Uh, but if you want a really direct one, the Passover. The Passover itself would be a perfect depiction of Jesus, the Messiah, who would come and be sacrificed. Um, all these truths are seen in the Old Testament. The Passover of Exodus chapter 12, instituted there in Egypt, was meant to be a perfect picture of Jesus, the Messiah. You know, the lamb that was slain, and if, if you put the blood on the door post, uh, there, there's so many things, a lamb in its first year, which is the prime of life for a lamb. Um, and, and there in the Exodus 12 narrative, it talks about the lamb that would be slain for all of the people. Even though there would be multiple lambs, it says singular, the lamb in the first year of life would be uh, killed. And then the blood would be applied to the doorpost so that the oldest, the firstborn would all be saved. And how would they put it on the doorpost? On the right and on the left, on the top, and then in the sap bowl at the bottom, which would, if you look at the shape, interestingly enough, it's the shape of a cross there in, in, the, in the blood, the way they would apply it. It's kind of a cool you know, foreshadow of the Messiah, Jesus. So that when John the Baptist sees Jesus walk up to the Jordan River, John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the whole world. Um, the Jews would have known what he's talking about there. Oh, he's, he's, you know, John the Baptist is saying that Jesus is the Lamb, the Messiah that's gonna save. But did people really know what they were hearing or know what Jesus was fulfilling? Well, because they didn't understand the prophecies of the Old Testament, a lot of them just didn't have a clue, which makes me glad that at least I get to be a part of a congregation that actually cares about Bible prophecy. A lot of churches and people, I think the same way the Sanhedrin, the Caiaphas, the Herodians, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the same reason they missed the Messiah in his first coming might just be the reason many people miss the Messiah in his second coming because they're totally unaware of what the Bible says about Jesus' coming. Uh, they, they should have known. Remember Jesus coming down with, with the colt of the donkey on Palm Sunday and he said, oh, Jerusalem, if you'd only known this thy day, uh, you know, what belongs to your, the truth that you're seeing right here. Like if you only knew, how would they have known? Answer, Daniel chapter nine. Very specific, very uh, powerful prophecy that they had um, ignored and didn't really know. So they didn't know what was happening on this, that, thy day. 
uh, of the Jews in Jerusalem. So uh, just like the end times theology, signs of the end times could be familiar. And we don't wanna be, uh, like the Bible says, don't be ignorant concerning the end times. The Bible says that over and over again. It's amazing how many churches just say, yeah, we're not gonna talk about that. It's too controversial, too divisive. Uh, nobody agrees on it, so let's just leave it out. We're poorer. The church of Jesus Christ is poorer because we leave out Bible prophecy as it, as it is, you know, it's interesting to me. Well, Jesus is saying stuff that a good Bible student of the Old Testament would have said, oh, this is fulfilling prophecy. Uh, right up there to verse two already. But verse three, it says, then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who is called Caiaphas and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. They're, they're coming up with a plan to take Jesus subtly, uh, secretly, and, uh, and crucify him or kill him, but they don't wanna make a big deal, so they're kind of trying to figure out how to sort of avoid the issue of the Passover and all that. Um, who is this Caiaphas? Well, this is an important uh, uh, thing that you should understand. Um, the high priest, he was the high priest at that time. Now, if you're a Bible student, who should the high priest be? Uh, in the Old Testament, there's very clear descriptions of what the high priest is supposed to be. What's one of the main attributes of the high priest in the Old Testament? Anybody? Some of you said it, I heard it. You have to be a descendant of Aaron. Aaron and his sons were the priests. Um, as it turns out, this, this guy wasn't. You say, well, then how was he the high priest? Well, originally the high priest um, passed from father to son through the Levitical line. Um, but when the Romans came on the scene, they uh, came to the area, of course, and, and controlled the whole nation there. The Iron Fist of Rome had been on Judea now in Jerusalem for quite some time. The Romans are in control. Um, and they began appointing their own, you know, basically their own Jewish high priest. They said, okay, you're gonna be the new high priest. Somebody who was a powerful person who would sort of work with the Roman Empire. And uh, the Romans would sort of use the high priest as a political puppet and uh, often would pay him off or give him money to sort of smooth things over with the Jews and what have you. And that's the case with Caiaphas. Caiaphas is one of the more famous high priests. There's an uh, old drawing of, of uh, Caiaphas as the guy that um, was you know, large and in charge over the Jews, but he really was just a puppet of the Romans. Uh, there's some interesting stuff. Um, Micah and I, we were in um, Jerusalem with our video camera and we were going through the Israel Museum, which is really cool. If you're ever in Jerusalem and have time to kill, you gotta go to Israel Museum because uh, there's some pretty cool stuff there. Uh, but one of the things that's there is, is Caiaphas's uh, ossuary, uh, which um, is interesting. On the very side of the uh, uh, ossuary, the, his name is inscribed there. Um, and it's the, basically the, the sarcophagus or the bone box, the, um, the ossuary of Caiaphas. And on the sides, it's his name is written, uh, you know, Joseph, the son of Caiaphas, which held the bones of, they found a 60 year old man's bones uh, that were male uh, there in this limestone uh, sarcophagus. You say, why are these sarcophagus? They must've been little tiny elves back then. Well, they, remember when they would say, you know, they gathered their bones? They literally did that. The Jews would gather the bones and put them in a small box. Um, this box uh, measures, you know, like 15 min inches high, 30 inches long uh, is about how big these ossuaries were. But, but they actually have Caiaphas's ossuary from Jerusalem. You might say, Brett, how could a, a high priest be so off that he would seek the life of the Messiah, want to kill the, the Messiah, the, the King of the Jews. Um, well, he was really nothing but a hireling, like I said earlier, appointed by the Romans. Uh, Caiaphas was appointed in AD 18 by the Roman prefect, uh, Valerius Gratus, who, um, who was the guy that was preceding Pontius Pilate. So Pontius Pilate's predecessor appointed uh, Caiaphas uh, during the time of John the Baptist's ministry, of all things. Um, uh, he was the father-in-law of Annas, the high priest. Annas had five sons um, and um, all became high priests um, and what have you. Um, but all that 
uh, to say, um, the last we hear of Caiaphas will be in the book of Acts at the trial of Peter and John. So we'll, we'll see Peter and John stand before uh, the same guy who's trying to kill Jesus, which is kind of interesting because the disciples initially were totally freaked out and afraid and assembled for fear of the Jews in that upper room in there in John chapter 20. And they were like, man, we, the, the way Jesus was treated, that's gonna happen to us. And they were totally afraid. But then Jesus appears to them and breathes on them in John 20 and says, be filled with the spirit. And then the disciples go to Jerusalem and the spirit comes upon them. And then Peter and James and John are as bold as can be. And when Caiaphas and those guys said, stop saying the name of Jesus, they said, um, you know, we ought to obey God rather than man. And they kept speaking the name of Jesus all over the town. And, uh, and so these same guys are gonna have it out for Peter, James, and John later on. Um, but all that to say, um, Jesus was already targeted. What was one of the big things that made, there's all kinds of things that made Caiaphas want to kill Jesus. Um, but you know, you could say he was healing people and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, they were shut down by Jesus, you know, rhetorically. They came and asked questions to try to tangle Jesus up in his words. But everything Jesus said was wisdom. And the people said, man, this one speaks his authority, not like the, the other religious dudes. So the, the, the priests and what have you, they were already jealous. But I would suggest perhaps one of the most egregious things to Caiaphas was something Jesus actually turned the tables on something that Caiaphas instituted. And I use that idiom, turning the tables, from where the idiom comes from. Jesus is the one who turned the tables uh, first and he turned Caiaphas' tables. Do you know that? Remember the changers of money that were sitting in the court of the Gentiles? That was Caiaphas doing that. And he was in charge of what was happening there, ripping off the people money. And Jesus turned the tables and said, take these things hence, hence don't allow my father's house to, to become a place of merchandise. Uh, and they, these guys were ripping off the people. That was Caiaphas's doing. And so most scholars believe, when did Caiaphas really get upset and say, we got to kill that guy? It probably happened um, when Jesus turned the tables there in uh, the court of the Gentiles uh, there. But all that to say, who was Caiaphas? He was, a, he was the high priest appointed by the Romans. He, interestingly enough, was also a Sadducee. Um, and remember, why were, the, why were they Sadducee? Anybody remember? They were Sadducee because they didn't believe in the resurrection. You can remember that. They didn't believe in the resurrection after life, so they were Sadducee. That's how you remember those guys. Uh, Caiaphas was one of them, a Sadducee. Also fairly liberal in their theology, by the way, as it turns out. Um, the Sadducees would often live for here and now, eat, drink, and be merry today, for tomorrow we die. Uh, because they didn't believe in life after death. Um, so that's why they lived that way. And Caiaphas was that sort of dude. Well, all that to say, Caiaphas is now planning subtly how he can kill Jesus, but he realizes he's got to do this in a way that's not going to allow the people to go into uproar. Um, very sensitive to that. Why would he worry about the people in an uproar? Well, he's the one paid off by the Romans to make sure things are cool. And if he's not doing that, then the Romans are gonna be ticked at him and then he's gonna be in big trouble. So there's a lot of reasons why Caiaphas is concerned about an uproar. Uh, that's one of them. Well, then we pick up verse five. It says, but they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. There, verse five, the plan was originally to kill Jesus sort of after the Passover, but what happened? Well, um, this is all part of the plan of the Bible, the prophecy of Jesus when he would be killed because we're gonna see how it lines up perfectly. The Passover, when the lamb was killed, it's gonna line up exactly with when Jesus would be killed. Isn't that something? How do you, line, how do you make that happen? Uh, you make the Romans kill someone on a specific time to fulfill a Jewish prophecy. Uh, you can't just make that happen. And, but I love how um, Jesus will fulfill the, the Passover. Um, there were three Jewish feasts that the men were required to celebrate and they would make their way to Jerusalem. The Feast of the Unleavened Bread, um, the Feast of the Weeks or Shavuot, um, marked uh, the, the wheat harvest, if you recall, when we were in the book of, uh, well, the Pentateuch, we talked about all the different feasts many times, but the Feast of Passover or the Seder uh, dinner, 
um, was the third. So you have Feast of Weeks, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Passover. Um, and, and we know how Jerusalem would have been during this time and why Caiaphas would have been so freaked out because there would be a lot of Jews. The conservative number estimate of Jews, because the men from all over Israel would have to come to Jerusalem during this time. So the question is how many people were in Jerusalem during this time in the first century with Jesus? And Jerusalem was quite a bit smaller than it is today. Um, we picture Jerusalem as a sprawled out city, you know, and when Jesus was there, but it, was, it actually wasn't you know, that huge comparatively. But minimally, they say there was about a million Jews uh, that would come into Jerusalem on the Passover. That, that's a huge, huge amount of people. It would have been elbow to elbow, no room uh, anywhere. It would have been packed to the gills. But um, that's the most conservative. Some people suggest, like Josephus, remember I told you about the historian from the first century? Josephus wrote, I think around 90 something uh, AD. Josephus wrote that when he was in Jerusalem, they sacrificed on Passover 250,000 lambs there on the Temple Mount. 250,000 lambs. Now, some people say, well, Josephus, he, was, he exaggerated on his history, uh, the antiquities as it's called. Um, but actually, as time goes by, archeologically, everything Josephus says has been proven to be pretty accurate. Um, and, and, and Josephus wasn't even a Bible-believing Christian. Uh, he was just a, a historian, a Jewish guy for the Romans. He was writing history. And he wrote that there were 250,000 lambs sacrificed. The laws, if you know the Old Testament law, there would be one lamb killed for every 10 Jews. That would be the sort of the number ratio. One lamb for every 10 Jews. Um, in fact, so many lambs were slain on the Temple Mount that uh, Josephus says it was like a river of blood flowing off the Temple Mount down out of the East Gate area, down to the Kidron Valley. And the Kidron, where there was a little river at the bottom, uh, would be flowing with what looked like blood on the Passover because of the 250,000 lambs sacrificed. Now, if you do the math, some argue uh, that Josephus was saying there must've been up to two million, two and a half million, I think is the, the tallest number you'll see uh, of Jews in Jerusalem on that particular Passover. So you gotta understand Jerusalem was packed full, uh, elbow to elbow people. When we go to Israel, I, I always kind of remind people of that. When we go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, which is one of my least favorite places to visit because it's probably not even really the place and people get crazy there. And you're elbow to elbow with people. Like, you're just like this. And I don't do well with that. Uh, I always worry that I'm gonna freak out in a crowd. And it's not good when you get a guy my size that says, I'm out of here. <laughs> people, people start flying and stuff. It's really nasty. It's really bad. Um, but I feel like that at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Now, uh, here's the thing. Uh, um, but you can kind of get a vibe with all the religion, you know, of, of, in, in Jerusalem, and you got the Greek Orthodox yelling at the Russians and the Jews and the Christians, and like there's people around the, especially around the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. There's all kinds of, uh, I've seen fights break out. I've been there when people were literally punching each other out in front of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre because of crowds and people, and their their group wasn't getting in to see where Jesus lay. I think you're kind of missing the point. <laughs> Uh, when you're uh, punching people out to see Jesus. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's, you, the, the reason that is actually a helpful thing is that was the vibe of the Passover. Jews packed in Jerusalem during that time. Um, now, uh, verse six is interesting. I'm gonna give you kind of a heads up for those of you that are into chronology because Matthew doesn't always claim to chronologically put everything perfectly. But um, we shift gears from chapter uh, 26 Verse six through 25, many scholars believe that this may have happened earlier chronologically leading up to getting into Jerusalem for what we're about to read. So it's almost like you're telling a story and you say, oh, the way we got there, verse six through 25, uh, now that we're here, then you keep reading in verse 26 and onward. So, so don't get too freaked out about the chronology of this chapter, um, but scholars believe six or 25 may have been an earlier time leading up to the rest of the story, just so you know. So verse six goes on, it says, now, when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, uh, Simon the leper no longer would have been a leper because people wouldn't have come over to his house. And how do you think Simon, who was once a leper, how do you suppose he became a non-leper? 
yeah, Jesus, Jesus cleansed the lepers. Uh, and he's no doubt this Simon was one. And I love that because who's having Jesus over at his house? The guy that was cleansed from leprosy. Um, people that have been healed or forgiven the most often have the biggest hearts for Jesus. There's an old saying, those that have been forgiven much, love much. And I think that that's true today as much as it was back in those days. And here's this leper, he's still called Simon the leper, um, but he's no longer a leper and that's because of Jesus. And I love that he's opening up his house there in Bethany to, for Jesus to hang out there. Verse seven, there uh, came unto him a woman having an alaba alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For you have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel that sh uh, shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. We looked at this on Sunday. Uh, the woman who we know from other passages is Mary of Bethany. Out of the six Marys, we see that this is Mary of Bethany. It's also uh, told there in Mark 14, verses three through nine, and John chapter 12, verses one through eight. Um, all of those stories coincide, but they give greater detail as you put them all together. Some people try to make an argument that there's contradiction. Did, he, did she pour the ointment on his feet or on his head? And uh, one of the things that I love about this, this, the Bible is it really is so picturesque and it, it stays consistent. Um, it's, it's, there's a thing called expositional constancy that will help you a lot if you kind of realize what's going on. For example, I told you that Matthew presents Jesus as king, but the Gospel of John presents Jesus as the humble servant. Isn't it interesting that in this story, Matthew, uh, the account is the woman pours the anointing oil on Jesus' head, um, which is very much, as we talked about on Sunday, a picture of those who would be anointed as prophet, priest, or king. Only Jesus can be anointed as all three of those. But that's what Matthew depicts, is, is Jesus being anointed as king, if you would, and for his burial. Whereas in John, he's anointed, if you would, on his feet. I think it was both. It ran down like the priest of the Old Testament. There's descriptions of Aaron, how the, the oil ran down his beard and down his body and went to his feet. And then Mary in John 12 is you know, wiping his feet with her hair. Um, that's, what, that's the way the story is. So both are true. Um, you know, it's just kind of cool. Uh, Old Testament priest anointed the head down to the feet. Um, Matthew presents Jesus as king. Uh, John presents Jesus as ser servant. It calls attention to the anointing feet. I think all of that is, uh, is interesting to me, how each gospel kind of has its own perspective. It doesn't make them wrong or contradictory. It just is a different perspective on the same story. Pretty important. And, and so we saw how there in verse eight, uh, how um, you know, this, this um, solemn act of worship was called a waste um, by the disciples. Um, Matthew here says the disciples in general, Mark's gospel says some of the disciples said, um, so there were some involved or thinking the same thing, but the ringleader, John points him out as Judas Iscariot is the one who said, what a waste. Um, in, in John, it says one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Um, and Judas is the guy, his name means praise, but he would be called son of perdition. And we briefly talked about that. Even though Judas is saying, what a waste. The sad part of the story is Judas, his name means praise, but he's the one who ends up being a waste. Um, he's called son of perdition. The word, um, the word um, perdition, the Greek word, there is an interesting word, apoleia, which means destruction, ruin, or waste. Needless squandering of a resource. Isn't that interesting? that the guy who says, what a waste, actually he was the one who be, was the son of perdition, the son of waste, as he's called in the Bible. What a sad story 
Judas is. And he's gonna be identified as the betrayer here in a bit. Um, but the thing is that we learned on Sunday, and I gotta just you know, remind us, don't be in the same camp ever as Judas Iscariot. Wouldn't you agree that's the guy you don't wanna follow his example? And his example here is that of one criticizing worship. Ge- genuine, heartfelt love for Jesus uh, was what Mary was doing. And he found reasons to criticize her for that. What a waste. We could have sold this perfume or this ointment uh, for a lot of money. Uh, we, we learned on Sunday it was about a year's salary worth of money, which in Portland, the average salary is uh, $64,000. That's a pretty expensive bottle of perfume or ointment or oil. Um, and she pours it out on Jesus. And Judas is there. What a waste. Don't ever be the person that calls um, worship a waste. Now, I gotta say this since it's Wednesday night. I'll give you guys a little, little extra here. We still need to be discerning, don't we, about worship. That's kind of an interesting conundrum because uh, some people say, yeah, you should never criticize worship. Yeah, but what if the worship is drawing attention to, to oneself? Uh, what, if, what if the worship is not even biblically sound or the words that are being sung are not in line with scripture? Um, we're still supposed to be, you know, uh, checking and judging, uh, you know, the, the fruit or the, the links to worship. Because um, I've heard this argument, for example. Some people say, Brett, why doesn't Nathan Creek, you know, sing Bethel music? Why don't we sing Bethel music? And truthfully, I'll just say, you know, as far as musicians, there's some great musicians in the Bethel music group, and um, I even know some of them. I like those musicians. Um, and uh, even have friends that have helped with Bethel music. It's, you know, but let me just say this. The reason we don't do Bethel music here is not, not because we think it's from Satan. We don't believe that. But we also don't agree with Bethel, the church doctrine at all. There's a real wacko doctrine coming from the church at Bethel. Now, here's the argument some of my friends who are involved with that tell me, Brett, the music is different than the actual teachings. You know, uh, Bill Johnson's teachings are different than, you know, the people that are coming in to do music. And I might, if I were to even give them that argument, here's my problem. Here's my problem. I don't want people to come to Atheist and go, oh, I love that song you guys are singing. Where'd you find it? And for us to have to say, well, we got it from Bethel. Oh, Bethel.com, look them up. And then they start looking and I don't want to point them in that direction because the, the doctrine that comes out of Bethel is not good. And if you're here saying, Brett, I, I disagree with you. Um, I would just say, take a hard look at the teaching that's come out of Bethel. And there's a reason, <laughs> there's a reason why all over the, the internet and YouTube and pastors and teachers and Bible teachers particularly are saying, yeah, it's, it's not solid biblical doctrine. Some people say, yeah, but Brett, it's the, you're criticizing worship, just like you know, Judas Iscariot. It's not that I'm criticizing worship, it's that I'm saying, I'm, I'm being like you know, Acts 20, to watch and warn the flock from bad teaching. We really need to do that. Um, it's, and, and you might say, but Brett, I like that, that Bethel song. Can I not listen to that? I would say, if you wanna drive down the road and listen to that music, good for you. I'm not gonna criticize you or say you're going to hell or anything like that. Um, I would just give you a word of caution. Make sure you don't follow the teaching that comes out of the Bethel church because it's, it's not good. And it does creep into the, the music. I'm just gonna say that. Some of the Bethel songs actually, you'll kind of go, oh yeah, this is not even really biblical. Some of the Bethel songs though, I have to say, are really amazingly touching and good. Um, but, but Brett, then why don't you use those songs? because we don't wanna point people that direction. Does that make sense? Some people would say, well, well we disagree with that. And I would say, fine. Uh, uh, when, you have, uh, when the Lord puts you in role, a leadership role of a church, you do what the Lord leads you to do. But our governing elder team has prayed about this. This is something we feel strongly about. And, um, and we want people to, to watch out for wrong teaching. Um, wrong teaching is not hard to find these days. That's, that's a bummer. But that also fulfills prophecy, doesn't it? that many would be lured away with, with wrong teaching. And I think one of the big lures right now is the, the music is the lure. Understandably, as a guy who likes music and appreciates good musicianship, uh, that's a lure that is drawing people from solid biblical doctrine. Well, all that to say, um, it's, not, uh, it's not right to be critical of worshipers. That's, that's important, just for the sake of being critical. Worship is not a waste of time. 
uh, whether that's singing songs or giving of money or serving or praying. There's all kinds of forms of worship. And God forbid that any of us be people who are criticizing people just for the sake of worshiping. That's where you get into real trouble. Well, all that to say back to Matthew 26, uh, verse nine. You might say, Brett, what, what's the doctrine of Bethel? Well, it's really slippery and it's tricky. I'm just gonna say, it's not an easy thing. And they've even tried to answer some of their criticisms recently on YouTube of the, you know things that have been leveled at Bethel's doctrine. And I feel like their attempt to make it answers, they've only incriminated themselves further. Um, but I'll tell you what the most slippery part of Bethel doctrine is, is minimizing Jesus and building yourself up to be almost like greater than Jesus. They take, a, and I know that they don't say it directly like that, but, but they, they, you know, like it's, maybe you remember that snippet I showed of one of the pastors saying, I've had to learn to forgive Jesus. Um, and, and when did we ever have to forgive Jesus? Can you imagine being Jesus who gave his life to die for the sins of the world and then have one of the people you died for say, I, I'm gonna try to learn to forgive you. Do you see it with that abomination of what that sounds like to me? Um, and then also, you know, the Bethel guys, you're gonna do greater things than Jesus because that's what Jesus said. That's really not taking that scripture rightly. And sort of, it's more about you and what you're gonna do for the kingdom and all this stuff. And it minimizes Jesus. And uh, there's other things that we could talk about. New age, bro, what about the glitter? And what about the miracles and all that stuff? Well, as it turns out, that's not even the doctrinal stuff I'm talking about. That's a little crazy if you ask me, glitter falling from the ceiling and, and grave soaking and all that stuff. That, um, that, uh, that's weird, but that's not even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about real doctrine about Jesus Christ and who he is. It's, it's important, important stuff. Um, all that to say, because the reason I say that is some people walked out as I started talking about Bethel um, and they probably missed that part, um, but that's the most important part as it turns out. Ha! Anyway, um, <laughs> well, <clears throat> Uh, so, you know, Judas was criticizing, not, not that he cared when he, when he said, oh, we could have given this money before. It was, Jesus said in John 12 account, in verse six, Jesus said, you know, he didn't really care about the poor, but he was a thief and he had a bag and he wanted to put the money in it himself. Um, so uh, Jesus calls them out. Uh, and, um, and really verses 10 through 13, Jesus lets us know what Mary was doing she was preparing and planned with a purpose to anoint him for his burial. And we talked about on Sunday how she was the only one who seems to get it, that Jesus was gonna die, and this is a big deal, and she was anointing him for his burial. Some scholars argue that she was acknowledging that he would raise up from the dead, and she was anointing him for his burial that he would come back from the grave. Uh, that's an argument that's interesting, and if there was anybody who would believe that Jesus could raise from the dead, Mary probably be the one because her brother Lazarus had just been raised from the dead. If you remember the, the, the account there in, in um, the other scriptures, um, Lazarus was raised from the dead. Then this story happened and uh, maybe she knew, maybe she was the one on the inside who knew that Jesus was uh, gonna raise up from the dead. But she uses this um, ointment. Um, what was this expensive ointment? Interesting, when, when we go to Petra, um, one of the things I like to point out is in that first century, where did all the myrrh and the spices and herbs and all that stuff come from to make um, uh, the very costly ointment? The new, uh, the other scriptures, Mark and Matthew, call it spike nerd. What is spike nerd? Well, it, it's a, a fancy way of saying the oil of nard. Brett, are we in suddenly the Lord of the Rings? What's the oil of nard? <laughs> Uh, what, what's the deal here? Well, it's a very expensive ointment uh, that was used. Like I said, $64,000 is probably what it was about. But it'd be mixed with myrrh and all those spices would come from you know, the east and it would all come through that trade post of Petra, the Nabataeans that were there in Petra. It's, um, it's, it's like you know, almost 100% of those spices and things and those expect, expensive ointments would go through there. And it's just kind of cool when you're standing in the ancient lost city of Petra to know that probably the very, the very spices that were used there, probably the gold, frankincense, and myrrh went through Petra on its way to Jesus. Petra was, a, was where everything funneled through. It was like the first big civilization crossing the desert. You'd go into Petra, 
uh, camp out there for a day or two and then make your way to Jerusalem ultimately. Uh, it's kind of, kind of fun. But, but mix, it, it, was, it was spiked or it was this very costly ointment mixed with myrrh. And the reason I tell you Wednesday night is that is myrrh is something to sort of track and watch. Myrrh is a fragrance that came through, uh, it was a substance that, that it would let off its fragrance through crushing. You'd crush it and this beautiful fragrance would come out of the myrrh. Um, can anybody guess where was the myrrh mostly coming from? A place called Smyrna. <laughs> Smyrna, which is really cool. Uh, I probably shouldn't get off on this rabbit trail, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> remember the seven churches of Asia Minor in the seven churches there? And do you remember which church Smyrna was? It was the persecuted church. And Jesus had nothing bad to say about them. Of the other five churches there were, but it was Smyrna and I think Philadelphia that got away with um, no criticism, but only commendation. And, and Jesus said, you're, you at Smyrna, you think you're poor, blind, naked, you know, messed up, but you are really rich. And they were the persecuted church. And at Smyrna is where they got myrrh and the beautiful fragrance came through what? Crushing. And that church at Smyrna was the first church that went through some really horrible persecution in the early first century. Um, and it was through that crushing, that church had a beautiful fragrance, which is kind of cool. Um, Smyrna, that's what we learned from the church of Smyrna. And, and that would be that same smell uh, when Jesus got the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Myrrh speaks of his death. Um, and, uh, and it was used for burial. Uh, that's, that's what, when John and Mark say it was ointment of spikenard, it'd be oil mixed with myrrh uh, that would make it very valuable. Uh, but all part of the uh, uh, anointing. You say, is that a little premature for embalming or burial? Um, I believe she was doing this as an act of worship, probably indicating his death and resurrection. Um, okay, so then after that, now verse 14, we come to where Judas starts to betray. Let's take a look, verse 14. It says, then one of the 12, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said unto them, what will you give me and I will deliver him to you? And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Interesting thing, Judas Iscariot. You know, um, what made Judas Iscariot betray Jesus? Well, at, at its root, I think we can all say, well, Satan entered into Judas Iscariot. Okay, well, we'll give you that. That's kind of the no-brainer part, yep. But were there other things too? I think the Bible gives us all kinds of reasons and narratives about Judas and who he was. We already know he was a thief. Uh, we learned that from John 12 in the same story that we just read. Um, but now we see that he's ready to betray Jesus. What, what was it that entered into his heart? Um, some scholars, uh, you know, Jesus was already sort of snapping at Judas here in the story that we just read. Here in uh, Matthew, it says in verse 10, when Jesus understood it, he said to them, why trouble ye the woman? Um, he, said, he said this, we know specifically to Judas as well as the other disciples, but in, in John's account, in John 17, in fact, um, uh, we see that um, it was totally um, off. Then said Jesus, let her alone, leave her alone. King James Version says, let her alone. Against the day of my burying, she hath kept this. John 12, seven is where Jesus looks to Judas and says, leave her alone. You never really hear Jesus speaking a cross word with any of the disciples until really this point. He might say, oh, how long have I been with you? You know, where's thy faith? You know, that kind of stuff. But it was more of a friendly pat on the back saying, come on guys. But this one is like, leave her alone. He, he, he really scolds Judas for his evil in criticizing Mary in this, uh, in this story. And, um, and calls, you know, he just called worship a waste. And so Jesus says, leave her alone. Now, the next thing in the story, Judas is off going to betray Jesus. Is Judas upset? Maybe Judas is done with all this first coming kind of notion. And he thinks that, man, Jesus isn't who he claimed to be. He's not coming to take over the Romans. Um, and then the next question is, did Jesus um, actually, or did Judas have any control over this situation? Boy, there's a philosophical question. 
did Judas betray Jesus or did, did, the, did the Lord put it in the heart of Judas to betray Jesus? Well, there's all kinds of scriptures that talk about this kind of stuff. Um, uh, and uh, was it his decision or was it made for the perp, was Judas born for this purpose to betray Jesus? And we can talk about divine election, predestination, predetermination of God, and all these things. And those are interesting debates, and I like talking about that stuff, but I always wanna bring it back to simplicity. The thing we should walk away with is, is don't be a Judas. Don't betray Jesus. Wouldn't you agree that's kind of something you shouldn't do? Um, yeah, I think sometimes we miss that in the esoteric argument about, um, about this. But, but when, when Jesus said, leave her alone, isn't that interesting? that um, that was the strong word that Jesus gave. Now, let's talk about the 30 pieces of silver. Um, well, I think this is all fulfilling. In fact, the, the verses that we just read, verses 14, 15, and 16, there's like four fulfillments of prophecy about Jesus' first coming, just in those verses right there. Remember I told you there's 300, uh, more than 300 prophecies specifically about the first coming of Christ. Four of them, check, 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 right there. Um, in, this, in these little verses. Um, here in Matthew chapter 26, we see that. Um, but I wanna show you uh, just even a few of those. Um, interesting about the 30 pieces of silver. What's the significance of that number? Well, um, there's a couple. Jot down Exodus 21, verses 30 through 32. Um, this is the rules, the laws. It says there in the Jewish law, it says, if there be laid on him a sum of money, then he shall give for a ransom of his life whatsoever is laid on him, whether he hath gored a son or have gored a daughter, according to this judgment shall it be done to him. If the ox shall push a manservant or a maidservant, he shall give unto their master 30 shekels of silver and the ox shall be stoned. If an ox gores a person, the price is 30 shekels of silver. The price for redeeming a slave, by the way, also, Redeeming a slave, yep. By the way, people say, um, is slavery condoned in the Bible? Never. People say that, you'll see YouTube, the Bible condones slavery. No, it doesn't. There was a move to regulate slavery in the Bible and God does that. And if you follow God's plan, the way God says in his word, slavery would have been abolished eventually. That was the way God worked it out. Slavery was a very real thing in Bible times, not like slavery of the deep south, um, it was a different kind of slavery and we could get into that. But um, one of the things, the redeeming price for a slave was 30 pieces of silver. Jot this one down, Zechariah 11, uh, verses 12 and 13. Um, Zechariah the prophet, and I, I said unto them, if you think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, cast it to the potter, a goodly price that, was, that I prized at them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. This is an interesting prophecy. And if you're just reading Zechariah in Zechariah's time, you think, oh, so they're gonna put some 30 pieces of silver and it's gonna go to the potter, whatever. But what were the 30 pieces of silver that Judas was gonna get here, ultimately gonna buy? The potter's field. Um, this is all part of Bible. This is, this is a, a, a speaking of what would happen prophetically. The, the money would be bought, used as you know, Judas would throw it back on the floor of the temple. They would scoop it up and buy the potter's field with it. Fulfilling Zechariah 11, 12 through 13. Every part of the story of the crucifixion of Jesus fits perfectly with Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah. Uh, you know, Palm Sunday, Jesus riding on a colt of a donkey, that he'd be betrayed. I mean, on and on and on the, the, the prophecies go. Zechariah 11 has four prophecies fulfilled that, I just, that I'm looking at right here. Um, the price would be 30 pieces of silver. The site or the, or the place of the transaction would be the temple. Uh, the ultimate recipient would be the potter's field and the nature of the trans transaction would be blood money. Um, th th there's so many prophecies about Jesus and his coming. The reason I, I, I harp on that again is prophecy is important, both in his first coming and his second coming. Um, I love bringing this up, I bring this up often, but an old book, an old scientific guy, Christian writer, chairman of the departments of mathematics and astronomy at Pasadena City College was a guy named Peter Stoner, and he wrote a, a book called Science Speaks, and he's the guy that talked about 300 prophecies about the first coming of Jesus. 
that were fulfilled perfectly. And he, as a statistician and a scientist and a mathematician, he said, what are the odds of just seven of those prophecies of Jesus coming to pass? And he did the math and he said, it's about one in 10 to the 17th power. That's, that's a, 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 a one with you know, 17 zeros after it. 17 zeros, that's a big number. Um, it's actually, I think 100 quadrillion is the number. What is that? What is, what is the odds of one in 100 quadrillion? Well, being a scientist, knowing that most of us don't understand the magnitude of that number, he brought the hay down from the loft for people like you and me. And he, he said this, take the state of California and you fill it full of nuts. <laughs> I didn't say anything. Uh, what, are, what, are you guys, what are you Oregonians laughing at there? <laughs> so you fill, you fill California three feet deep with nuts, three feet deep, nuts. And then you fly an airplane over California and there's a little chipmunk in the airplane and you put a little backpack on him and a little a parachute and poof, you kick him out. And there goes the little chipmunk falling down into California somewhere past Redding, Sacramento, all flying around with wind blowing. And finally, poof. Now before we th did that to poor Chip, um, we put a black X on one of the nuts somewhere in California and planted it somewhere in California and the little chipmunk reaches down and picks up a nut and eats it. What are the odds of him picking up the nut in the state of California, three feet deep of nuts? The very nut that you put the single X on, it'd be one in 10 to the 17th power. That's, that's the odds of that happening. That's just the odds of Jesus fulfilling seven prophecies about his specific life. But Jesus fulfilled all 300, so you can only imagine what kind of a number that would be. Um, I, the reason I love that is just, just remember, the, the, only the Lord knows the beginning from the end. He knows the future, and that's why we study Bible prophecy. It's proven to be accurate time and time again. Well, all that to say, Matthew 26, now we pick up in verse 17. Now it says, the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? Good question. And Jesus said, go into the city to such a man and say unto him, the master saith, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. <laughs> What are we supposed to do, Lord? Okay, find some guy and tell him our master's coming to your house for dinner. Uh, hello, uh, which guy am I supposed to say now? Now this is funny because Matthew doesn't give a very detailed description of this. I think that's funny. Matthew says, yeah, find some dude, look, good luck. Um, but Mark tells us a little more and this is, this is an interesting addition. In Mark 14, 13 through 15, it says, and, and he sent forth two of the disciples and said to them, go ye into the city, there you shall meet a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him, and wheresoever he shall go in, say to the goodman of the house, the master saith, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared there, make ready for us. So we have a little more detail from Mark where it's a guy, you say, well, Brett, that's not helpful, a guy bearing a pitcher of water? Well, that is helpful, and I'll tell you why. In that culture, um, men didn't bear pitchers of water the way it should be. No, I'm just totally kidding, <laughs> totally joking. I know this isn't a culture you're supposed to say, stuff like that. Um, no, no, this is funny. When I was in Africa um, quite a few years ago, um, I actually was amazed at these ladies that are able to carry these big pot. They carry pots of water or giant baskets of fruit, like heavy baskets on their heads. And they just, they'd be holding like a baby or two babies walking down the street with 30 melons up in a basket on their head. And I was just like, how is that even possible? And um, so I was in one of these villages and this lady had just put down this pot uh, that she'd been walking with no hands, walking, balancing. And when you watch them, man, they know how to like move their head just perfect to make sure it never falls. And then when they get the baby put down and all this, then they take the pot down. And I, I was like, how do you do that, you know? And, uh, and so this one lady said, well, you wanna try it? You know, and I had an interpreter there and she, uh, she, she said, well, okay. And all the ladies were laughing that I wanted to try. 
So I stuck this pot on my head. They have this little towel that they put on their head and then this, this uh, pot goes on here and I was trying to do it and I was horrible at it. But the ladies were laughing. I thought, oh, they're, they think I'm really bad at it. But, but then the men all started laughing too and they were all laughing like rolling laughter at what I was doing. I was like, okay, I know I'm bad at this but I'm not that bad. Well, as it turns out for a man to be carrying a pot on his head, like that, I was pretty much a homosexual at that point. Uh, <laughs> in, their, in their mind, I mean, they're like, they're like, uh, um, you know, it's like, I was so embarrassed because the guy, one of the guys said, yeah, men, men don't do that here, you know. Um, and they were all laughing at me. Uh, that's still true in some places around the world. Well, that was true in the first century as well. So the, the idea of a man carrying a pot of water, uh, well, that's a sign, oh, that, that's the guy you're gonna pick. Um, so that's the operational term here in this passage that would identify the person who had the house that was gonna be for the upper room usage. And what would they be doing there? They'd be, they'd be getting ready for the Passover Seder dinner. How many of you guys have actually done a Seder dinner or Passover dinner? Raise your hands. Okay, that's pretty cool. We need to do one again. One time we did one at Athey Creek, but that was when we were a tiny little church of 500 people and we were able to have everybody do the Passover. Now um, we'd have to have 20 Passovers uh, here at the church and I don't know how to do that. But, but all that to say, uh, um, it, it, it's kind of a cool thing as long as it's a get to and not a got to. I gotta say that. Some Christians sort of make it, well, if you're really spiritual, you'll do the Passover dinner. And that's totally wrong. If somebody's sort of treating the Passover like that, they've missed the whole point. The Passover, however, or Seder dinner is cool because everything in it points to the coming of the Messiah. The Jews were supposed to keep the Passover from the, that was instituted there in Exodus chapter 12, the killing of the lamb and the eating of the bitter herbs and all the stuff. It all came from the Jewish traditions and laws, but everything points to Jesus Christ. Now, you say, well, Brett, why don't we keep the Passover? Well, we were given a new way to remember Jesus, only they were looking forward to Jesus through history to the Passover. We look backward through history to Jesus through communion. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. He's gonna institute the Last Supper or the table of communion, Eucharist, whatever you wanna call it. But... Um, but the lamb, one of the 250,000 sheep that were sacrificed, spices, herbs, unleavened bread, baked eggs, all part of the, <clears throat> the Passover, <coughs> excuse me, dinner. But it was a beautiful illustration. Um, and, uh, and it's not something we must do, but it is something that's fun to do. If you know someone who knows how to do it, um, and there's quite a procedure that's part of it, that, and it's fun to see it as it relates to the coming Messiah. Um, it, it's interesting to me that a lot of Jews keep the Passover Seder dinner, but they don't know it's all about Jesus. Uh, they're still blinded to that. Romans 9, 10, and 11 <clears throat> tells us that. Um, so they're, they're um, getting ready for this, this Passover dinner, and that's the guy. Well, verse 19, it says, and the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, um, and they made ready the Passover. Now, when evening was come, they sat down with the 12, and as they did eat, he said, verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say to him, Lord, is it I? Talk about a party killer. I mean, here they are celebrating the Passover, just like they're eating. You know, I can just picture in my mind's eye, they're talking about fun, having good, you know. And then somebody says, one of you is gonna betray me. And there's Peter, you know, you can hear a pin, a pin drop, and there's Peter with a piece of matzah in his mouth. <laughs> what did he just say? Yeah, one, one of you is gonna betray me. Um, and then they ask, Lord, is it I? Now, this is something I can relate to. And so can you, because you know what? We're sinners, we're all sinners, we all fall short. And the disciples were nervous enough to think, am I the one that could do this? Um, we, we already know which one's doing it, it's Judas Iscariot. And you think, well, why did Peter think? Or why did these other guys think? Because we're all sinners. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, the original language of the Greek New Testament, it's not as much, uh, Lord, is it I, as much, Lord, it's not me, is it? That's more of the original language of the Greek. It's not, it's not me, is it? 
Um, and in a moment of honesty, you, you all have to know that we're all potentially huge sinners and we could do horrible things. I hope you never think more highly of yourself than you ought, and me too. I remember when I had a jail ministry, I was, I was going every other Sunday night to Jackson County Jail. And in that jail ministry, I've been to you know, prisons and, and some of the hardcore, I've been in the shoe at, uh, at, uh, down in Northern California at the, um, the place where Charles Manson was kept there uh, at the prison down there in, in um, what am I thinking of it? Pelican Bay, that's where I was, yeah. And um, we did a, some music in the shoe, which you have to be trained and get permits to go into the shoe. It's the hardest of the hard. Those people were just scary, and I'm just gonna say that. But the jail was different because they were guys that were like drunk driving and did some things, shifty business stuff. And, and I remember sitting there one Sunday night as I was sharing the word with these people that were in jail. <clears throat> I remember thinking, the Lord just said, Brett, this could be you. Like one dumb decision, one bad choice, uh, this could be you. Uh, there was a funny thing that happened there. My wife, Debbie, who was a model and uh, did a lot of stuff, commercials and stuff. She actually was in some award-winning com commercials and stuff, when, or won national awards. But one of the things, she was also uh, famously in one of the unsolved mysteries. Uh, Debbie acted as this guy who, um, who was in Southern Oregon, who uh, left with several million dollars of people's money and just ran uh, across the country and nobody knew where he went. And um, it was kind of an interesting thing because nobody knew where he was. And so Debbie played the, you know, played, you know was an actor acting like his wife on this show. Um, and well, because of the show, the pictures showed, uh, they found this guy somewhere, I think it was in Montana or Idaho or something because of the show. He got busted, dragged back down to Medford and was thrown in the Jackson County Jail. So there I am on Sunday night ministering to these guys and this guy's sitting there, I'm like, my wife pretty much got you in prison. It's because <laughs> of the show. I didn't tell him that, I didn't say anything. Um, that poor guy, that was a sad story because he, he was, it was a, kind of a horrible situation, but um, I believe that guy actually is saved and, and got saved and recommitted his life to the Lord. Kind of cool story there, but um, but I remember just thinking, I could be any one of these guys, and so could you. That's why I think the disciples say, Lord, is it, is it me? Because we know that we all fall short. We all can make mistakes. And, and in some ways, you know, better men in ministry have fallen than me. Better churches than ours have crushed, been crushed by moral failure. Um, you know, we have to remember, we got to stay humble and realize that we could be the ones who are, are the sinners that have fallen. So the disciples recognize this. It's a good word for us to be on our guard. Verse 23, we're almost done for the evening. Verse 23, and he answered and said, he that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The son of man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It hath been good for that man if he had not been born. Again, speaking of, you know, is the Lord predetermining Judas's future? Well, yes. Um, then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it, I, is it I? And he said unto him, Thou hast said. Um, this is interesting because um, Judas knew it was him. He'd already done the act. We read that in verses 14, 15, and 16. And it's so sad. But we remember, you know, the Lord chooses who he's gonna put down and who he's gonna put up. And if we don't like that, just, you know, remember, God says, Romans chapter nine, verse 21, hath not the potter power over the clay, the same to make one vessel unto honor and one vessel to dishonor. Judas was made for the purpose of the betrayal. That's kind of a harsh deal. Well, that didn't give Judas a chance to choose. Well, I believe somehow in God's cosmic power, he's able to give Judas a chance to choose, but he also predetermined. Well, you can't have both. I just did, and I enjoyed it. Um, why, why did I say that? It's because God can do whatever he wants. And, and I think we're, we're inside these laws of time, space, and physics. We're very limited, but God is outside of all those laws of time, space, and physics. He knows, and we submit ourselves to him in that. Well, now he, he then says, verse 26, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and break it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. 
So here Jesus institutes the Last Supper. We talk about this often because we do the act of communion often here at Athey Creek. Every other Sunday night, we have our Sunday night worship services specifically around communion. It's something we're told to do often in remembrance of Jesus. I hope that's a part of your Christian faith. A lot of you have been ruined by church tradition. Um, you know, I, I see it, you know, if, if, you're, if you come from a strong Catholic background, you're like, Brett, where's the pointy hats? Where's the guy that puts the wafer on my tongue? This isn't real communion. No, I would say we're doing more real communion perhaps than, than what tradition has made the taking of communion. Um, some of you are from the Slavic community. And there's this notion that unless you were baptized in the Slavic church uh, and you're part of a church, you really better not have communion uh, in another church or something like that. Totally ridiculous. There's no biblical backing of that at all. Um, I, I'm saying that not to be disrespectful to the Slavic church. I'm just saying they're wrong on that. They've made church tradition something that restricts people. Anytime you're restricting people from just taking a simple act of eating bread and drinking of the cup and remembering what Jesus has done, as soon as you add to that where it becomes prohibitive, you're off, way off course, way I remember when I was visiting this beautiful Christian sister, she was an amazing lady um, who loved Jesus and she was dying of cancer. And I visited her in the hospital up there at the cancer treatment center up off of 84 Providence. And, uh, and when I came into her room, she was just kind of quietly weeping there. And I thought, well, you know, of course she's, she's dying. Uh, they told her she only has a few days to live, but that's not why she was weeping. She was weeping because <clears throat> the, the Catholic priest came through there just a few minutes earlier, and she asked for the, the Lord's table, communion. Before she died, she wanted to have that. And the priest said, oh, I'm sorry, you can't do that because you're not a Catholic. And I, you, you know, if you're in the Catholic church, you're like, well, yeah, that's kind of the way they roll. <laughs> but in that particular situation, I found my blood boil just a little bit, uh, but good news. I have a portable communion set in my uh, ministry bag out in my vehicle. And I, I literally was able to run down, get, get the elements and the cup and the, the, the matzo bread. And we celebrated communion right there in that room. And it was an awesome moment. Um, yeah, <laughs> that, was, that was, but, but can you see why we, we should, if, if people are prohibiting people from coming to the table of the Lord, um, I think we're off course. There is, you know, 1 Corinthians uh, that talks about, you know, not eating and drinking unworthily, but that's, that's the idea of not giving worth or value to it. It's not that you have to be worthy by being baptized into the Slavic church or baptized into the Catholic church. Uh, none of us are worthy. I don't care what church you go to, you're not worthy if that's what you have to be, but that's not what it's saying. The idea is not giving worth or value. If you just kind of go, oh, here's communion, bottoms up, you know, another time to drink, you know, uh, then you, you're missing the point. That's eating un, unworthily. First Corinthians talks about that. But, um, but we don't do Passover, we do communion. Don't forget First, first Corinthians 5, 7. It says, purge out the old leaven that there be a new lump as you are unleavened for Christ is our Passover. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So we don't do the Passover dinner anymore. We do Jesus, our Passover. We, we remember that in communion. The cup, the bread, cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Jot down 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 30 for cross-reference about eating and drinking unworthily. It's something we have to do, give value and worth to it. You do it with reverence. If you flippantly do it, then you're gonna be off course. And that's what we have to watch out for. Uh, that's 1 Corinthians 11, uh, um, 23 through 30. Now, before we leave this, I have to tack this on. And we're, again, we're just gonna finish here, just a couple more verses. Um, some of you say, Brett, why do you guys use grape juice? Where's the wine? Are you guys afraid of wine? Not afraid of wine. Um, but in our culture, we have so much problem with alcoholism and people that struggle with being alcoholics. If you only knew the stories, the people, even in our church, people have been, you know, been off of alcohol for so long. It's just, uh, um, it's out of love. We use Welch's grape juice. Uh, our church is bad that use wine, nope. Um, but just here at Athey, we've, we've said, let's use the grape juice. Um, and you say, well, Brett, I'm just being like Jesus. I love to drink alcohol. Jesus drank alcohol, I'm gonna drink alcohol. Um, and I always kind of go, well, boy, you got me because you're just being like Jesus. <laughs> boy, 
Only there's one problem. Look at verse 29. Jesus said after the communion service, he said, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus no longer drinks alcohol. He did, I'll give it to you. Jesus turned water into wine and it was the good stuff. We know that, it was the good stuff. The, the governor of the feast said that, but Jesus said, after this communion supper, I am no longer gonna, that's why, by the way, after he rose from the grave, we never see him drinking wine after he rose again, because he said, I'm not gonna drink until I'm in my father's kingdom. That's the second coming. So if you wanna be like Jesus, you're, you're actually, I'm joking a little bit on this, but <laughs> if you're saying you're like Jesus, he's actually a teetotaler to the kingdom. Uh, that's, that's what it says here. Well, finally, verse 30, this is our last verse of the night. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Notice it says, an hymn. Not a bunch of songs. Um, he didn't require a, a worship team or smoke or lights. <laughs> he didn't require uh, skilled musicians. It's just Jesus saying a hymn. And if you look in your margin for that, when it says a hymn, the word there is a psalm. And it was probably, we know, that they did this on the Passover. They sang one of the Hallel Psalms. Remember when we were in the Psalms and we, we went over all the Hallel Psalms? It was probably one of those, uh, to be honest with you. Um, Psalm 113 through Psalm 118 is the Hallel Psalms. And the reason I, I, I go on this, speaking of Bethel and all this stuff, people make such a big deal out of music and we really shouldn't. Music is wonderful. I'm a musician, I love music. But the church, sometimes I fear we worship worship. It's more about worship. There's people that choose what church they go to based on the music more than the doctrine. Bethel's a good example of that. Most people, if they really took the time to hear the doctrine and some of the new age stuff that Bethel is kind of reported and all this stuff, they would say, yeah, I probably shouldn't go to that. But they, they're so grabbed by the music. How important was the music in the New Testament church? How many times is music mentioned in the New Testament? Well, this is one of the few places it's mentioned and he's saying a hymn. And there was not a guitar to be seen anywhere. No, no keyboards, no smoke or lights. He just sang a hymn. Um, and really that's the only, it says, you know, in Ephesians we read about songs and hymns, spiritual songs speaking to one another, uh, you know, words as, as what we're supposed to do. Um, that's be filled with the spirit, not with, the, with wine, but speaking songs and hymns, spiritual songs one to another. That's what we're told to do. So there is that, but that's it pretty much. Jesus sang a hymn. Ephesians talks about singing songs and hymns. And then you got maybe in the book of Revelation when we're standing before the throne of God, we're singing before the throne of God. So I'm not diminishing. I love worship. I love singing songs and that's why we do it here at Athe. But let's, let's keep it all in perspective. Um, let's remember that it's not all about the music and the worship. It's, it's, really, it's really about Jesus. And we, I think sometimes we get that a little bit off kilter. So let's, let's be wise in Jesus' name. We'll, uh, we'll go into the apprehension and the Garden of Gethsemane next week. Lord, we thank you for this crew, Lord, tonight that's covered this section of scripture. May it bring forth fruit in our lives. Give us the abilities to, to uh, hear your word and not just be uh, hearers, but doers as well. So bless these, your people, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.